The Pacific Ocean is larger than the Earth's total land mass and connects people and cultures in a unique way. The Pacific Islands, also referred to as Oceania, comprise vast terrestrial and marine ecosystems and are home to most of the world's biodiversity. Contrary to their peaceful image, the Pacific Islands are experiencing increasing social, ethnic, and political tensions and conflicts that are aggravated, if not caused, by the unfolding climate crisis, as well as the globally organized ruthless exploitation of its natural resources and the resulting disputes. The region's environmental and social challenges are numerous. Agricultural and industrial pollution, ocean acidification, overfishing, terrestrial and marine mining, deforestation, radioactivity, and hazardous waste dumping are taking their toll on ecosystems and societies. Island states are the first to suffer the effects of the climate crisis, which is already causing the loss of life and livelihoods and is forcing residents to abandon their villages and ancestral lands. To this day, the region remains colonized and militarized. More than one-third of the 17 non-self-governing territories recognized by the United Nations are located in Oceania. Denied the right to determine their own political and economic future, it is difficult for many Pacific communities to develop sustainably and along their own cultural lines. Indigenous Melanesians in West Papua, East Indonesia, are exposed to discrimination and violence, political prisoners, torture, killings by security forces, and hundreds of arrests during countless demonstrations reflect the degree of political and racial oppression. The region is a microcosm of challenges the world faces today. The Blue Continent's people and environment are already experiencing the adverse impacts brought on by the climate crisis and the ruthless exploitation of terrestrial and maritime resources. Local initiatives, churches, environmental and development organizations are building networks across Oceania and strongly demand political, economic, and environmental justice. Today, Pacific Islanders are calling for a demilitarized future for the region, with security provided not by foreign military bases, but by a strong and independent local economy centered on traditional cultures and environmental sustainability. Hey, aloha. Greetings. Thank you so much, uh, Julia, for having me. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm, I'm so honored to be part of this program, uh, important topic of, of climate change in the Pacific. And I'm excited to, to share some of my, my poetry uh, with you today. I'm going to try to um, share screen. Is that okay? Let's see. Is it possible? It looks like it won't allow me to share screen. Well, you're the host now. Um, so it should be possible. Okay, let me try. If not, Jan, uh, Greg can send his uh, file to you and you can share it on your screen. Okay, I think, let's see. Okay, here we go. Yeah, it works. You can see that? Okay. Yes, Wonderful. it's fine. Okay, so today I'm going to read from uh, my new book called Habitat Threshold. And it was published here in the US uh, last year. You could see the cover. The image on the front cover in the middle is actually my, my father. Uh, it's a photograph I took of him when we uh, took my oldest daughter to meet the ocean for the first time here in Hawaii. Uh, and you can see that in the middle. On the top, you can see uh, an image, which I didn't take, but is of uh, melting glaciers. And on the bottom image, you can see uh, fire and smoke, <clears throat> a picture from the California wildfires which is where my parents now live. Uh, in the back of the cover, you can see in the background, 
uh, picture of plastic. These are uh, collections of plastic that has been gathered from, from many of, of the Pacific Islands. And so uh, these are some of the themes that I bring together throughout this book, uh, thinking about uh, environmental poetry, environmental justice, ecology, uh, climate change, human-animal relations, the Anthropocene, and so on. And so the poems I'll, I'll share with you today kind of touch upon uh, each of these different themes. So to help if, if anybody wants to, to read along, uh, I'm going to do a single page, might be easier. There you go. <clears throat> this first poem is called Age of Plastic. The doctor presses the pr plastic probe against my pregnant wife's belly. Plastic leaches estrogenic and toxic chemicals. Ultrasound waves pulse between plastic tissue, fluid, and bone until the embryo echoes. Plastic makes this possible. My wife labors at home in an inflatable plastic tub. Plastic disrupts hormonal and endocrine systems. After delivery, she stores her placenta in a plastic freezer bag. Plastic is the perfect creation because it never dies. Our daughter sucks on a plastic pacifier. Whales, plankton, shrimp, and birds confuse plastic for food. The plastic pump whirls, breast milk drips into a plastic bottle. Plastic keeps food, water, and medicine fresh, yet how empty plastic must feel to be birthed, used, then disposed by us degrading creators. In the oceans, one ton of plastic exists for every three tons of fish. How free plastic must feel when it finally arrives to the paradise of the Pacific gyre, will plastic make life impossible? Our daughter falls asleep in a plastic crib and I dream that she's composed of plastic so that she too will survive our wasteful hands. So that is the, the first poem in the book and as you can see, I, I wrote it um, you know, right after my daughter was born. And so you'll see a lot of these poems uh, feature her and kind of speak to uh, you know, being a new parent and the anxiety I feel of, of uh, you know, raising a child during a time of, of climate change. This next poem <clears throat> is a, it's a darker poem. It's called Halloween in the Anthropocene a necropastoral. <clears throat> of course, Halloween is a holiday here in the U.S. where kids dress up in different costumes and knock, knock on people's doors to, to get candy. <clears throat> and I was thinking about um, this kind of scary holiday in terms of the pastoral uh, or the tradition of, of writing about beautiful landscapes. But in this case, I wanted to write a necropastoral or a uh, pastoral of death. Darkness spills across the sky like an oil plume. The moon reflects bleached coral. Tonight, let us praise the sacrificed. Praise the souls of black boys enslaved by supply change who haul bags of cacao under West African heat. Trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good to eat sings a girl dressed as a Disney princess. Tonight, let us praise the souls of brown girls who sew our clothes as fire on thread sweatshops into charred flesh. Trick or treat, smell my feet, give me something good, whisper kids disguised as ninjas. Tonight, let us praise the souls of Asian teens who manufacture toys and tech until gravity sharpens their bodies enough to cut through suicide nets. Trick or treat, smell my feet, give me, chant 
kids masquerading as cowboys and Indians. Tonight, let us praise the souls of native youth whose eyes are open pit uranium mines, veins are poison rivers, hearts are tar sands tailings ponds. Tonight, let us praise our mothers of fallout, mothers of cancer clusters, mothers of slow violence, pray for us because our costumes won't hide the true cost of our greed. Tonight, let us praise our mothers of extinction, mothers of miscarriage, mothers of cheap nature. Pray for us because even tomorrow will be haunted. So a lot of these poems, as you will see, will um, kind of reckon with the impacts of, of environmental injustice, um, both here in the Pacific and around the world. <clears throat> this next poem um, is called Rings of Fire, and it takes place here in Hawaii, and it was written um, after the first birthday of, of my eldest daughter. So this was in, in 2015. And as you will see, addresses um, the theme of wildfires that I mentioned earlier. Rings of Fire. We host our daughter's first birthday party during the hottest April in history. Outside, <clears throat> outside, my dad grills meat over charcoal. Inside, my mom steams rice and roasts vegetables. They've traveled from California where drought carves trees into tinder. Paradise is burning. When our daughter's first fever spiked, the doctor said it's a sign she's fighting infection. Bloodshed surges with global temperatures, which know no borders. If her fever doesn't break, the doctor continued, take her to the emergency room. Airstrikes detonate hospitals in Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, South Sudan. When she crowned, my wife said, it felt like rings of fire. Volcanoes erupt along Pacific fault lines. Sweltering heat waves scorch Australia. Forests in Indonesia are raised for palm oil plantations. Their ashes flock like ghost birds to our distant rib cages. Still, I crave an unfiltered cigarette, even though I quit years ago and my breath no longer smells like my grandfather's overflowing ashtray. His parched cough still punctures the black lungs of cancer and denial. If she struggles to breathe, the doctor advised, give her an asthma inhaler. But tonight, we sing happy birthday and blow out the candles together. <sighs> Smoke trembles as if we all exhaled the same flammable wish. So very sadly, um, my daughter is now seven. <clears throat> and every every birthday she has is, has been the hottest in, in history here in Hawaii. And this summer has been 90 degrees Fahrenheit all week too. So it seems like it's gonna break, break more records. <clears throat> and so from, from the wildfires, uh, we now go to, to the Arctic. Uh, this next poem is called 13 Ways of Looking at a Glacier. And it's a, a recycling of a famous Wallace Stevens, American poet poem called 13 Ways of Looking at a Blackbird, which you might be familiar with. 13, among starving polar bears, the only moving thing was the edge of a glacier. 12, we are of one ecology, like a planet in which there were once 200,000 glaciers. 11, the glacier absorbs greenhouse gas. We are a large part of the biosphere. 10, 
humans and animals are kin. Humans and animals and glaciers are kin. We do not know which to fear more, the terror of change or the terror of uncertainty. The glacier calving or just after. Eight. Icebergs fill the vast ocean with titanic wrecks. The mass of the glacier disappears to and fro. The threat hidden in the crevasse and irreversible claws. Seven, oh, vulnerable humans, why do you engineer seawalls? Do you not see how the glacier already floods the streets of the cities around you? Six, I know king tides and lurid unprecedented storms, but I know too that the glacier is involved in what I know. Five, when the glacial terminus broke, it marked the beginning of one of many waves. Four, at the rumble of a glacier losing its equilibrium, Every tourist in the new Arctic chased ice quickly. Three, Shell explored the poles for offshore drilling. Once we blocked them in that we understood the risk of an oil spill to a glacier. Two, the sea is rising. The glacier must be retreating. One, it was summer all winter. It was melting and it was going to melt. The last glacier fits in our warm hands. This next poem uh, takes place at one of my daughter's favorite places. It's a aquarium. Uh, in Waikiki, which is a, a very famous tourist destination here on the island of Oahu. A sonnet at the edge of the reef. We dip our hands into the outdoor reef exhibit and touch sea cucumber and red urchin as butterfly fish swim by. A docent explains, once a year after the full moon, when tides swell to a certain height, and salt water reaches the perfect temperature. Only then will the ocean cue coral polyps to spawn in synchrony, a galaxy of gametes, which dances to the surface, fertilizes, opens, forms larvae, roots to seafloor, and grows generation upon generation. At home, we read a children's book the Great Barrier Reef to our daughters snuggling between us in bed. We don't mention corals bleaching, reared in labs or frozen. And isn't our silence too a kind of shelter? So of course this poem uh, about coral spawning. Uh, if you've never seen that, I highly recommend to uh, search on, on YouTube to see coral spawning. It's an amazing underwater event. Okay, this next poem is called Care, and it was uh, written for, for World Refugee Day uh, during the height of, of the Syrian war. And we had an event here in Hawaii to, to raise money and awareness about, about this particular refugee crisis. And I was uh, able to, to perform this poem at that event. Care. Our daughter wakes from her nap and cries. I pick her up, press her against my chest and whisper, daddy's here, daddy's here. Here is the island of Oahu, 8,500 miles from Syria. But what if Pacific trade winds suddenly became flames and shrapnel indiscriminately barreling towards us? What if shadows cast upon our windows aren't plumeria tree branches, but soldiers and terrorists marching? 
Daddy's here. Daddy's here, I whisper. Would we reach the Mediterranean in time? Am I strong enough to straighten my legs into a mast balanced with the pull and drift of the currents? Am I brave enough to bear her across the razor wires of foreign countries and racial hatred? Could I plead, please help us? Please just let us pass. Please, we aren't suicide bombs. Could I keep walking if my feet crack like Halabi pepper fields after five years of drought, after this drought of humanity? Daddy's here, daddy's here. Trains and buses rock back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to detention centers. But what if our desperate boat capsizes? Could I inflate my body into a buoy to hold her above rough waves? Daddy's here, daddy. Will drowning be the last lullaby of the sea? Or will we carry each other towards the horizon of care? next poem is um, it's another sonnet, and it's called A Love in a Time of Climate Change. It was written after uh, Pablo Neruda's uh, famous love sonnet, 17. I don't love you as if you were rare earth metals, conflict diamonds, or reserves of crude oil that cause war. I love you as one loves the most vulnerable species, urgently, between the habitat and its loss. I love you as one loves the last seed saved within a vault, gestating the heritage of our roots. And thanks to your body, the taste that ripens from its fruit still lives sweetly on my tongue. I love you without knowing how or when this world will end. I love you organically, without pesticides. I love you like this because we'll only survive in the nitrogen-rich compost of our embrace. So close that your emissions of carbon are mine. So close that your sea rises with my heat. Okay, so I wanted to share a, a, a few poems about uh, human and, and animal relations. Uh, this first is called One Fish, Two Fish, Plastics, Dead Fish. And it's, the, uh, it's a recycling of a Dr. Seuss, famous Dr. Seuss book uh, that, I, that I read to my daughter a lot. And uh, you know, I kind of gave it a twist for it to be about, uh, about some of the issues affecting uh, fish stocks here in the Pacific. <clears throat> some fish are sold for sashimi, some are sold to canneries, and some are caught by hungry slaves to feed what wealthy tourists crave. Farm fish, fish sticks, frankenfish collapse. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the Indian to the Arctic, from here to there, dead zones are everywhere. Overfishing, purse seam, ghost fishing, bycatch. This one has a little radiation. This one has a little mercury. Oh me, oh my, what schools of bloated fish float by. Here are fish that used to spawn, but now the water is too warm. Some are predators and some are prey. Who will survive? I can't say. Say, look at its tumors. One, two, three. How many tumors do you see? Two fish, one fish, 
filet of fish, no fish. It's kind of a, a very, uh, a very twisted uh, children, <laughs> children's book. All right, this poem takes us to uh, <clears throat> another one of my daughter's favorite places. It's the, the Honolulu Zoo here. And we actually uh, just went back to it a, a few weeks ago. Um, and I wrote this poem for, for World Elephants Day, one of uh, her favorite animals. It's called Blood Ivory. When we reach the elephant enclosure, I lift our daughter up so she can see them playing in shallow, shallow ponds. Look, I say, they love the water just like you. Today, 96 elephants are being massacred across Africa's scarred savanna. Armed poachers surround the herds who stomp trumpet and encircle their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick wrinkled skin. Do the men still feel awe or majesty or do they only feel their own awful poverty as they sever the incisors once used to split bark and forage? Warlords will sell this white gold to be carved into jewelry, relics, and art, then smuggled across the planet, our man-made elephant graveyard. This year, 35,000 will be slain. Our daughter waves goodbye to them as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed, to display what we dominate? or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing being. Our daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Look, I say, it has ears, eyes, and a mouth, just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. Okay, this next poem is, is about another large, a large animal. Uh, it's called Echolocation. And it's dedicated to a, a orca, uh, a whale named J35 or Talekwa. Uh, you might have heard the story about this whale a couple years ago. Uh, she gave birth to a calf, but sadly the calf died. Um, but instead of letting the calf sink, uh, this mother whale, uh, ended up carrying the dead calf for a couple weeks um, and it made the news here in Hawaii and across the US and, and possibly around the world as well. And it was it was very sad because you know it happened for a couple of weeks and so we my wife and I were kind of following the story every day on the news just because it was um, very emotional. Uh, and of course my wife and I being new parents too we, we felt in some ways could feel uh, her pain. And so it's called echolocation. My wife plays with our daughter while I cook dinner. On the news, we watch you struggle to balance dead calf on your rostrum. Days pass. We drive our daughter to preschool and to the hospital for vaccinations. You carry your decomposing, you carry your child's decomposing body a thousand nautical miles until every wave is an elegy, until our planet is an open casket. How do you say sorry in your dialect of sonar calls and whistles? What is mourning but our shared echo location? Today you let go so her body could fall and feed others. And somehow you keep swimming. We walk to the beach so our daughter can build sandcastles. May she grow in the wake of your resilience. 
May we always remember love is our wildest oceanic instinct. And so it's very, very sad to you know, follow the, the grieving journey of this whale a couple of years ago. Um, and their pod is, of course, endangered because uh, they're having a hard time finding enough food. Um, but just last year, actually, during the pandemic, the same well uh, gave birth again to, to another child. And uh, apparently it's very healthy and, and strong. And so um, it, was, it was very powerful to, to hear that story. Okay, I just have two more poems to share. Uh, this next one is called The Last Safe Habitat and is dedicated to a native Hawaiian bird called the kawaii o'o, which is a kind of um, kind of a honey catcher. And it's this particular bird's song was last heard here in Hawaii in 1987. The last safe habitat. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to memorize and recite the names of 77 lost species and subspecies. I don't want her to draw a timeline with the years each was first collected and last cited. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o, who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree, calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind. Until one day, he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived safely to their destination, a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Okay, thank you so much again for, for listening. Uh, my final poem um, is about the ocean, and I know it's kind of the, the thing that brings us all together uh, today. Uh, it's called Praise Song for Oceania, and it was written for uh, World Oceans Day, which was just a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Praise Song for Oceania. Praise your capacity for birth fluid currents and trenchant darkness. Praise our briny beginning, source of every breath. Praise your capacity for renewal, ascent into clouds and descent into rain. Praise your underground aquifers, rivers and lakes, ice sheets and glaciers. Praise your watersheds and hydrologic cycles. Praise your capacity to endure, the violation of those who map you, 
aqua nullius, who claim dominion over you, who pillage and divide your body into latitudes and longitudes, who scar your middle passages. Praise your capacity to survive, our trawling boats breaching your open wounds and taking from your collapsing depths. Praise your capacity to dilute our heavy metals and greenhouse gases, sewage and radioactive waste, pollutants and plastics. Praise your capacity to bury our shipwrecks and ruined cities. Praise your watery grave, human reef of bones. Praise your capacity to remember your library of drowned stories, museum of lost treasures, your vast archive of desire. Praise your tidalectics, your migrant routes and submarine routes. Praise your capacity to smother whales and fish and wash them ashore, to save them from our cruelty, to show us what we're no longer allowed to take to starve us like your corals starved and bleached, liquid lungs choked of oxygen. Praise your capacity to forgive. Please forgive our territorial hands and acidic breath. Please forgive our nuclear arms and naval bodies. Please forgive our concrete dams and cabling veins. Please forgive our deafening sonar and lustful tourisms. Please forgive our invasive drilling and deep sea mining. Please forgive our extractions and trespasses. Praise your capacity for mercy. Please let my grandpa catch just one more fish. Please make it stop raining soon. Please make it rain soon. Please spare our fragile farms and fruit trees. Please spare our low-lying islands and atolls. Please spare our coastal villages and cities. Please let us cross safely to a land without war. Praise your capacity for healing. Praise your cleansing rituals. Praise your holy baptisms. Please protect our daughter when she swims in your currents. Praise your halcyon nests. Praise your Pacific stillness. Praise your breathless calm. Praise your capacity for hope. Praise your rainbow warrior and peace boat. Praise your hokulea and sea shepherd. Praise your Arctic sunrise and freedom flotillas. Praise your nuclear free and independent Pacific movement. Praise your marine stewardship councils and sustainable fisheries. Praise your radical seafarers and native navigators. Praise your sacred water walkers. Praise your activist kayaks and traditional canoes. Praise your ocean conservancies and surf rider foundations. Praise your aquanauts and hydro labs. Praise your ocean cleanup and Google oceans. Praise your whale hunting and shark finning bands. Praise your sanctuaries and no take zones. Praise your pharmacopoeia of new antibiotics. Praise your hashtag ocean optimism and ocean elders. Praise your wave and tidal energy. Praise your blue humanities. Praise your capacity for echolocation. Praise our names for you that translate into creation stories and song maps. Tasi, Kai, Tai, Moana Nui, Vasa, Tahi, Lake. Vaitui Wansawara. Praise your capacity for communion. Praise our common heritage. Praise our pathway and promise to each other. Praise our most powerful metaphor. Praise your vision of belonging. Praise our endless saga. 
Praise your blue planet's one world ocean. Praise our transoceanic past, present, future flowing through our blood. Thank you so much for, for listening. I'm again so honored to be part of this series and I appreciate all the, the programming and focusing that, that you're doing uh, on the Pacific, uh, all the way from Germany. So, you know, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm happy to, to engage in any questions or, or conversation for the next few minutes that, that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. And I might uh, finish by saying praise to you because <laughs> <laughs> the last poem you did is full of the challenges we here in Germany try to raise awareness for while um, doing lobbying with our governments uh, to, uh, for protection of uh, the Pacific Ocean. So I'm really impressed and it's quite hard for me now in a foreign language to impress my gratitude. I hope you can see it in my face that I'm impressed. <laughs> I was nearly shivering whilst you were um, reciting your poems. I'm really glad you did this. And of course, we will... Um, buy this book which by the way won a very famous book award recently just last week and uh, i'm sure my colleague steffi and me we will publish uh, those poems in our publications if you allow us to do so and please feel free to all our participants to ask craig uh, who by the way he is a professor teaching eco poetry um, at the university of manoa so if you like to learn how to write poems like him uh, you must go to hawaii and <laughs> sign up with the university and do studies with craig and then in a couple of years you might be able to write such impressive poems so if you have any questions my colleague jan will moderate your questions just put on your microphone and ask your questions there's one question holger please uh, switch on your micro if you might Sure. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, it's so great to hear your poems. Um, I've watched a few videos already of yours, uh, including the last one. I think you've set to a visual um, uh, a video as well. And I showed that to my students in a Pacific history course I teach uh, at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, so far away, <laughs> but uh, in the US. Um, so I just wanted to ask you more broadly about your different roles um, as a researcher, as a teacher and poet, and you know how you decide on which hat to wear, and you, you like wearing hats, I see. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in which in which situation, and how you how do you kind of like prioritize one thing over the other? Um, how are they connected for you? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your kind words and, and for teaching my my poetry in in your class. I'm very honored. Uh, definitely, you know, for me. Uh, all of these these different roles or, or hats um, give me, me different uh, joys in some ways. Uh, I, I really love teaching, uh, being in the classroom, uh, especially teaching eco poetry, uh, because I, I feel that poetry is is a very creative way to um, get students to engage with environmental issues, and um, and so to me, it's it's you know, can, it helps them connect to the issues beyond science and also gives them a, a space to express what they might be feeling, um, you know, through poetry. So it's also a creative writing class. So, you know, we don't just study the poetry, but the students also write uh, their own work in response. Uh, beyond that, uh, you know, being a, a writer myself, I, you know, gives me a space to, again, express my, my own emotions that I've been been experiencing these last couple of years, um, really confronting um, the the crisis of climate change, and and of course being a new parent, being a, a Pacific Islander, and so poetry has helped me tremendously, um, you know, to deal with these issues. And beyond that, uh, I'm, I've been very honored to been able to read my poems at. Uh, you know, like climate change rallies and marches and, and environmental conferences and in other spaces that, uh, you know, where I can share my poetry and it could again be uh, a way to, to confront these issues 
in a more creative way. Uh, the researcher part is is not as fun. <laughs> uh, you know, being an academic and doing a lot of reading uh, and and writing essays about this topic is probably my biggest challenge. Um, but you know, I also feel it's important, you know, to engage with these issues on an academic level. I mostly write about uh, Pacific literature and themes of, of environmentalism, decolonization, and indigenous identity. And so what, op what often happens when I'm doing research and writing essays is I'll get extremely bored with it and I'll have to write a poem like immediately after. <laughs> and so uh, in some ways, the doing the research is perhaps like eating my vegetables and, and then writing the poetry is, is the fun part of, of my life. So I try to just make time for each and enjoy them in different ways. And sometimes they, they help balance out each other. But thank you for that question. Thank you very much. We have um, around five minutes, five to 10 minutes more. So please, if you have more questions, um, knowing that it was quite a lot and hard, a lot to digest, if you have more questions, take the unique opportunity to ask them now, if you like. Maybe if, because there's no hand up and nothing in the chat, I, I feel free to ask one little question with, with connection to what was asked before. Um, first of all, thanks, thanks so much also from my end. I really enjoyed it. Although they're like really disturbing issues you, you, you write about, um, it's, it was wonderful to listen to, to, to your voice and see and see your poems. Um, and like others here in the room, I look at this as a campaigner, as an advocacy um, and lobby campaigner on these issues. And we always have a hard time um, making, making a change, making change possible and happen. Um, and as asked before, you wear different hats and that's, you looking on yourself, but how are your poems and the way, the things you do perceive from from others? So, are you seen as a as an artist or a political campaigner, political activist? Is it both? Um, and then looking back on yourself, is are you okay with this perception from out, coming from others? Um, or you you want to be seen purely as an artist or the political campaigner or yeah, so that would be my question. Yes, great question. Uh, definitely for me, I've always, you know, written, like at least when I, I sit down to write a poem, it's always first, as I said, to, to kind of express myself and um, engage with what I might be feeling or, or thinking about on a topic. And, you know, I just feel like it's been, it's been very fortunate the past couple of years that <clears throat> there's been more space within the activist and political arenas um, to share poetry. And even um, within the area of, of the sciences, uh, there's been a lot more collaboration between science and the humanities. And so, you know, I think part of that is, is because with, you know, like with political activism or campaigns, um, you know, you don't really want to listen to political speeches all the time and or to listen to politicians all the time, which sometimes, you know, they often do not uh, speak deeply or emotionally, but they're more, uh, you know, have their political speech. And so uh, it's great to, to see more poets and artists and, and musicians at um, political rallies and, and climate change marches because you know, I feel like they express more of, of the human side, more deep uh, emotion and truth telling about the issues. And so, so for me, that creates kind of a space for, for poets within you know, climate justice movements, for example, or environmental justice movements. Um, and then, you know, I feel like also the this happens in, in the realm of, of education as well. So it's not just that, that poetry has um, a space in, in politics, but also in terms of um, 
developing either environmental literacy or climate change communication, um, the humanities, I think, have an important role to play in terms of, again, uh, telling human stories beyond data or beyond graphs and beyond the facts that you know, are often disputed as well. And so I think these, these kinds of human stories are, are so important so that we can see how climate change uh, is impacting you know, people around the world and how it's um, affecting their everyday lives. And, and of course, the hope is that um, you know, these stories and these poems will uh, inspire and empower others and hopefully cultivate uh, empathy or sympathy for those who, who might be suffering from, you know, whether it's climate displacement or rising sea levels or other kinds of uh, injustices that are going on. And so, you know, it does put a little more pressure as a poet. Uh, you know, we can't just write our poems and, and you know, just put them in our journals and, and not do anything with them. But I think it creates a an impetus for us as well to become more involved in, in politics and in education and in, in the larger uh, climate change campaign. Thank you, Greg. So, uh, you are all in one, so to say. <laughs> if I may summarize this. Uh, thanks a lot again. And you are also not only a role model when it comes to poetic writing, but also I think a role model for gender justice because it's eight o'clock now in the morning in Hawaii. And you need to take your daughter to school, which you told me just before we had our session. So, um, and we like to, of course, close our session in time for the German news, which started at eight o'clock. So, mm. <laughs> so yeah. thanks again um, for joining us uh, from Hawaii. And we certainly will stay in contact and will publish uh, some more poems uh, from you, uh, Craig. And you know us in case you want us to publish anything, just contact us and Jan and me. I think, Jan, we have a lot to think about how we can activate uh, our German audience whilst um, listening to uh, eco poetry. This was the best example we got this evening. Thanks a lot to all the participants for joining from near and far. Have a nice evening. Good day in Hawaii. Take care, Craig. Stay safe and healthy and hope to meet you all again in good health. Bye-bye. <laughs>